Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to have each and every one of you here. And very, very quickly, please, I ask you to share this on your wall. Start a watch party because tonight we're going to talk about something that I think everybody needs to hear. You need to hear. Your wives, your husbands, your friends, even your enemies need to hear because this is a thing that has affected all of us in this season. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with BDM, the best show in town. And I know you love the show and that's why right now I can see you having a watch party and inviting very many of your friends. Bishop David Morey, thank you again for allowing us to glean on your wisdom and those of us who are watching and uh, we have many people who watch this show and this is going to be another bumper show. COVID-19 has happened, we cannot ignore. The big boys, the developed countries, everywhere. I mean, this has leveled the ground. And many things have come out of this, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But there's one that we cannot ignore. This is depression. People have lost jobs, Bishop. There is a lot of uh, uncertainty. And that makes people wonder what next. What is your take? What do you tell somebody who is watching you right now? And he's saying, I'm on my last uh, string. I'm about to give up. What will my kids eat? Well, thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> I think one of the things that uh, surprises me and shocks me is the number of people who could be depressed and they're not aware about it. Wow. So then what is depression then? Uh, depression comes in many forms. Uh, there are signs to look out for when it comes to depression. For instance, if you've got loss of energy, loss of appetite, you're cutting out from people, you just want to be sleeping, you don't want to see the light, uh, darkness seems to be where you want to live and to dwell. So depression comes in many forms. And uh, normally what they do to be able to establish if somebody has got depression or not is to look out for the signs of depression. Right. Unfortunately, most people who go through depressions don't even know the signs or the telltale signs of what depression is all about. But I want to, uh, in my introductory remarks, to say that depression is very real. And depression uh, is not something to joke around with. Uh, depression starts uh, physically, first of all, but if it's not taken care of, it, takes to an, it goes to another level of spirituality where it becomes now the devil himself sitting on you and depressing you. So you have to be careful because depression has got stages and it has got different uh, uh, colors that it takes if it's not attended to. It starts just like, you know, small signs and stuff, but then if it's not taken care of, it gets into, of course, the physical, and after the physical, if it's not taken care of, it becomes a spiritual thing that needs to be attended to. And it becomes a demon that needs to be cast out or to be prayed about. You've talked about loss of energy, Bishop. Is that the only sign? Could somebody be depressed and they seem to be the life of the party, seem to be smiling and maybe talking and everybody saying, oh, you are, you're always lively. Could that also be a sign when somebody overindulges? Well, most of the people who are depressed, uh, generally speaking, will not be laughing and smiling. Most people who are depressed uh, will not be happy. Uh, most people who are depressed will avoid gatherings. Uh, most people who are depressed will avoid even friends. Most people who are depressed will have their phones off, uh, will not text back. Uh, depression isolates you. So it's very, very few people who can be depressed and go on with life as normal. So that's one of the signs that you need to look out for. So. For the viewers who are watching, I think you need to just do a quick analysis of uh, the people around you. Some may just say, oh, I'm just tired, I just want to sleep. That could be a sign that the bishop is talking about and something needs to be done. It's a physical, uh, something physical about it. And if not uh, arrested early enough, it can get to spiritual. That means then there's the medical part of it and there's the spiritual where the church needs to come in. How can the church or what do you think the church should do at this time? To be a voice of hope to these people who are depressed, depressed because some of the people who are depressed are church members, are people who uh, serve in church, but now they are all lost. What can we do as the church? Well, I think I think the statistics are scary, to speak the truth. Uh, I was reading the newspaper uh, a week ago, and uh, they were saying that most people are depressed now in this country, depressed because of loss of jobs. Uh, as you mentioned before, yes. uh, depressed because uh, some people uh, salaries have been cut off and they're used to a particular lifestyle. Uh, depressed because of relationships that have gone sour. Uh, so many reasons. So uh, I can say without a shadow of doubt that uh, if, if not 90% of people who are depressed, the degrees may vary. Yes, sir. The degrees of depression may vary. 
but COVID-19 has depressed literally everybody. I personally think it's from the state house to the slums. Wow, powerful. From the state house to the slums. I think, so. I wow. think so. I mean, even the president is depressed about it. I mean, we have no solutions to this thing. One of the things about life is that when you lose solutions, when you don't have solutions to something, you tend to be depressed. When you feel overwhelmed and you feel like it's beyond you and you feel like you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And that's what the government has done. If they can be honest, COVID has not just defeated us in Kenya. COVID has messed up the entire world. We can't have a grasp on it. And any time a human being gets to a place where they don't see light at the end of the tunnel or they don't have the solutions to the problems they're confronting, they have some form of depression that grabs, grabs them and grips them and they've got to be careful. What do we do? Well, I think there are many things we can do. Uh, first of all, to look up to God. Uh, second of all is uh, to try and uh, look, people who are depressed who are watching us, I think you need to look for somebody who can stand with you. I think you need to look for somebody who can be your support system during this time. Uh, somebody who will not judge you, somebody who will love on you, somebody who will be checking on you. Uh, I think you need to uh, start getting back to normal, you know, irregardless of uh, your financial status. Uh, I think you need to consider uh, going back to those groups and laughing and having fun, you know, so that at least you can get back to the grind of life. Because if you don't get back to the grind of life, then uh, you're going to remain uh, uh, depressed. Uh, that's what the psychologists will tell you, and that's what I would tell you uh, from my many studies, that you need to consider somebody, you need to consider God, you need to consider going back. But also, uh, interesting enough is that, you know, when you're depressed, you don't want to consider somebody else. It's basically I, me, and myself. Yes. But one of the biggest antidotes to depression is to look for people that you can reach out to and help yourself, even in your state. Wow, absolutely. But some people who are depressed manifest by cutting themselves off from other people. And so it may be difficult for them to reach out. What would you tell somebody now who, after listening to you in the first few minutes, is saying, no wonder my husband, my son, my daughter, my wife, my friend has been behaving this way. So what would you advise somebody who is not depressed? What is their approach to get to somebody who is depressed to try and get them out, to trust them fast now? Because not every depressed person will reach out. So what do we do now if we now have just discovered I have a depressed person in my house? I think, uh, uh, thank you for the good question. I think one of the things that you need to understand is that uh, uh, the fact that you understand somebody is depressed, that is half the solution. Mm -hmm. And then uh, knowing that uh, these people need to be brought slowly but carefully and keenly uh, back to the grind of life and back to, you know, uh, the circles of how life operates, that will be a great plus for them. Making them laugh, uh, making them go back to text messages, making them going back to calling people, uh, making them to switch on their phone, making them to go to shower, because some people who are depressed even don't want to shower. You know, going back to normal is what you want to try and do, and before long, they'll find themselves on their two feet. So the biggest thing to do to a depressed person, and I can tell you for sure that so, so, so many people are depressed in this country. Uh, alcohol consumption has gone high, very high. Yes, I know the government says that the restaurants should not sell alcohol and stuff, but uh, it's not helping uh, in terms of depression. It's helping in terms of maybe the spread of COVID-19. But when it comes to depression, I can tell you that the people who were were not even drinking are now drinking because you don't have a job. You, your business is as closed. You don't see it coming back. Uh, and you think of uh, what is the purpose of life. And depression comes to a place where it actually challenges you and shows you, uh, puts this bleak picture that there is no purpose for living. Uh, and when you get to that, you're completely on the floor. You're completely on ground zero. And you're depressed. And I can tell you, when you get to that place, you can see, I don't know if you know, you're aware that uh, suicide uh, has risen in this country. Yes, sir. Suicide levels have gone up. Uh, we have issues. We have too many issues that we are dealing with. Too many issues. Uh, teenage pregnancies has gone up. Uh, you know, you're just uh, reading numbers, but that translates to somebody's daughter. It translates to somebody's father who's thinking about a daughter who is pregnant who has not finished school. So this, these are things that are really, really disturbing this country. And depression is easy and can settle in and find a door to come in and settle in people's homes. Wow. I don't know what you're going through. Um, but it's very clear from what the bishop is saying. 
it's cutting across board. So you, I know this is a very cliche statement, you are not alone. The truth of the matter is that you're not alone. Bishop, um, let me veer off a little bit, but it still has a string on depression. Because of this COVID-19, there's a lot of work from home formula from the various companies, the blue chip companies, whatever company. So there's a lot of spending time together. And uh, one ugly demon that has come in this season is domestic violence. How? What do you say about that? Domestic <laughs> violence is on the rise. Well, I personally think that working from home has got uh, pluses, you know, and it has got negatives, depending with how you take, you take it. Uh, I can say without a shadow of doubt that uh, the people who are struggling and the people who are fighting and the people who are, are having challenges are people who have never learned how to enjoy each other's company from the beginning and from the start. Relationships is about learning how to enjoy each other's company. So if you know how to enjoy each other's company, if you know how to enjoy each other's uh, space, you know, then this is the best time ever. Uh, you'll be able to do things you've never done before. Uh, you'll be able to enjoy somebody's company like you've never done before because initially you didn't have the time. Mm -hmm. Now you have all the time. Uh, this is the person you said you loved. How can you be with somebody that you said you love and you still can't enjoy uh, each other's company and the time you have together? So if you know how to enjoy each other's company, if you know how to bring the best out of each other, these are things that happen in relation, bringing the best in people, enjoying each other's company, you know, uh, celebrating each other, you know, you, this will be the best time for you. But if you don't do those things, then this will be the hellish moment like never before in your life because you just want to escape, but you can't escape. There's curfew, by the way, so, and many other things that are going on. So where are you going to go? There's no bar you can go to, you know, your friends are also, having issues. Your friends are also depressed. Your friends are also having challenges of how to raise their money. Their businesses have closed. Some of them will never come back. Yeah. So you're all by yourself. So the best thing to do is to enjoy each other's company in the house. Well, for those of you who are enjoying it, please, congratulations and keep on keeping on. But there's somebody else, Bishop, is shouting. Okay, fine. How then do I enjoy the company? Give me I, a few tips of the things I should do. I'm trying to wonder even before I answer that. Yes. Could this be a season that is magnifying something that was already there? Ooh. All right. Okay. Wow. I'm just trying to think aloud. And I'm that's just trying very, to think aloud. That's a very strong thought. Because that could be the case, actually. So then what happens? This has revealed. Then it calls for us to assess our relationships. This could be a moment that maybe just magnified what existed before. It didn't bring it. It just magnified it because it was there, but it was being covered under the wraps of busyness and being uh, at the place of work and being with friends and being out. Going you to know, the bar after work. And going to the bar and uh, playing golf the whole day and stuff and all the other things that we use. But could this be the moment in the season, you know, that is bring about some things in a relationship that we never knew existed? Wow. I'm just wondering. That's a very, it's a pregnant thought. It's, I think it's a... Uh, that is actually what is happening for the greater percentage of many who are struggling with each so other right now. So if that then is the truth that, hey, we have got issues in our relationship, are these issues fixable? Are they fixable? Can we, can we, can we sit down and say, hey, and look each other eye, eyeball to eyeball and say, hey, we've got some things we need to resolve here if you're going to move on? Or are we going to be together and suck salt for the rest of our lives? So something must be done. It's, it's evident swim or you drown allow me bishop to you you talked about um parents are, di are, are distressed and uh, depressed about pregnancies of their daughters and they haven't even finished easy. school now something happened a few days ago and i saw this in my friend's uh, facebook status a father a father molested actually raped his own daughter biological daughter so parents are depressed but their children right now who wish uh, to be in school because now by being at home they are seeing domestic violence being at home that should be the safest place a father raping their own daughter so what would you t what would you speak about these children what would you tell them now there's a, a form two watching there's a form three watching that's, that's and they wish they'd be in school 
uh, sorry, I think that is a warped father. Yeah. That is an insane man. That is somebody who needs his hair to be checked. Uh, that is a mental case yeah. to me. Uh, when a father begins to look at their own daughter sexually, uh, they are mental. Absolutely. It's not supposed to be. Uh, it's not even African. It's not even uh, our way of thinking. I mean, uh, I, I can never ever in the life of me think of looking at my daughter sexually. Yeah. Ever. So when a father has been looking, because you see, it didn't happen the same day. It's something that was building up. Thought after thought. It was thought after thought. You know, uh, they say normally what you think, you know, is you what act you act. It. Yes. So he has been thinking about it and he, eventually because he didn't uh, capture those thoughts and, and pull them down and bring them to, uh, to, to submission, then they became actions. Okay? Now when it becomes an action, if it's not stopped, it becomes a habit. If it's not stopped as a habit, it becomes a character. So I don't know where this father was. Mm -hmm. I would love to talk to him and see. Uh, maybe something he's been doing to other people. Maybe it's some, because a thought, an action, a habit, and character. then it graduates to a character. You know, wow. so he needs to be assessed. And even if he's gone, he's taken to court, the first thing they're going to do is take him to a mental hospital. Yes, sir. And check whether he's fine or not. So many, many people... Uh are depressed I, uh, let me finish this yes. because I think it's important for me to say this it, it, it's ridiculous uh, for us to have these fights and abnormalities in our settings in the family and take them as norms these are not norms we mm. need to change them a home is supposed to be a nice place a home is supposed to be a happy place safe a hope is supposed to be a safe place you know so uh, why is it that we are not fighting to bring normalcy and to bring happiness and joy and to live lives in keeping with uh, how God has ordained for lives to be lived in the home. That's what we need to be fighting for. So these other abnormalities, they're just completely off and warped and uh, nothing even to follow, really. It's completely off. It's completely off. And if you are watching us and you have got a situation that is completely off and it's warped, then I think by the grace of God, you should struggle to make it right. So you can have peace, so you can have joy, so you can have a home <laughs> otherwise it's going to be uh, not even a home in the first place yes it's going to be uh, what what would you consider that where a father is raping a daughter uh, what wicked. what would you consider that that's not even a home that's not a home that has been turned into a hellish situation absolutely completely indescribable unimaginable that a man, a father, could even think of looking at a dog. Forget about even the action. The thought. Just the thought of looking at your daughter sexually. You're completely off. You need to completely check yourself and stop yourself. And say, hey, this is off. Completely. This is wrong. And stop yourself right there. Because the red lights are, are on. And you can't move on with the red, red lights on. This is completely off. Now, this is one case that came to the fore. Uh... And maybe there's a high school kid watching child right now and saying, okay, fine. I think I've also gone through that. Are there some of the telltale signs uh, that maybe a relative should pick up from a child who maybe is being abused by somebody who they're supposed to trust and somebody in authority? Because they, they use a lot of fear. Many, a greater percentage of the children who have been molested by people in authority, a father, an uncle, uh, mother, they say they threatened that if I speak, they will kill me. So it will take somebody else to look with another eye. What are some of these telltale signs? You'd be shocked that the stats show that most people who are raped, they are raped by relatives. Absolutely. People who they trusted. People they trusted. Uncles, fathers, brothers and on and on. Most girls who have been raped at a tender age were raped by relatives. And of course the telltale science is the seduction that goes into it. Because they seduce them the same way they seduce a grown up woman. Yes. Uh, they seduce them with gifts. You know, cheap gifts. And, uh, and, and girls are, can be prone to cheap gifts. And of course they don't know what they're getting themselves into. Yes. Uh, and before you know then uh, they are being abused. And after being abused, they are threatened. 
you're not supposed to say this yeah. uh, because if you say it, you know, there'll be consequences to you. There are consequences to you and so on and so on. But basically the telltale signs are the basic uh, seductions that men are uh, used towards grown up women. And it's basically gifts that they give, sweets and chocolates, you know, uh, cheap, cheap fake gold and stuff, all those nice things that, uh, the, that uh, uh, you know, can excite a small, tender, uh, young uh, age girl. Yes. And, and of course, eventually, by the time they know it, then they're in the wrong place, and the person takes advantage of them, you know, and and the and, and the girl is damaged. Well, if, if there's somebody watching us, and maybe your child has gone through that, or you are a young girl who is going through this kind of abuse, mm. but you have nobody to talk to, I think it's time to reach out to somebody so that you get help uh, before it gets to a very very bad place. I think I like go to talk about getting help. Because most of these people who are raped, uh, these young girls, uh, they need uh, a lot of counseling. Yes. Uh, counseling that will go on for a while so that they can be able to love themselves again and so that they can be able to love men again. Most uh, girls who are raped at a tender age hate men even after they've grown up. Not only do they hate men, they hate sex. So you can have a man who has married a girl who was, and they don't know, a girl who was abused when they were young. And when it comes to sex, then there'll be problems and issues because that lingers back to her being abused. Absolutely. And she will treat the husband the way she treated the same person who raped her. So that's why they need help. So they don't treat the husband in light of their past mistreatments by men. Yes. So they need counseling to come out of it and to live normal and ordinary lives. Wow, I, I think you agree with me that this is heavy stuff. And at this point, I would like us to take a breather. We'll see you after the break. It's Coffee with BDM. Who is an honest man? One who will not lose his individuality in a crown. People get into a place and they become just like everybody else. An honest man respects other people the same way they expect to be respected. Who is an honest man? One who has the courage of his conviction. Courage of conviction. You are not afraid to speak up what your convictions are. We have Christians today and dubious things happen in the organizations they work for. Yes, they are Christians, but they don't have the courage to stand for what is true. Thank you very much. I believe you've taken a breather. I'm telling you, even at the break, you're saying, man, we need to just take some cold water. Bishop is dropping some very heavy stuff, but pertinent issues that are affecting all of us. Some are being whispered, some are being swept under the carpet. But this day, today, this evening, we're revealing it as it is. Bishop, the country is depressed. I mean, I love what you said, from State House to the slums, from Western Province to the Coast Province, Nairobi, and whatever. So... The churches are slowly coming back into gatherings, and we are coming back into gathering. We are not receiving the same people who we had before COVID-19 restrictions happened. So we may have some people who are backslidden, some who have gone into some habits of drinking because of depression, job losses, some who don't know what next. Some are victims of domestic violence. As the church, should we just receive them and just go on as if nothing ever happened? What should be the message the church should give to our members when they come back? And the country, because the church is a fabric of the country. Well, thank you for that question. I think I, think, uh, I like uh, your observation. Uh, I would love to use maybe a crude word, but maybe it can apply. Uh, churches are going to be receiving damaged goods. Yes. Our members have been damaged in terms of the pressure in terms of uh, being laid off, uh, the stresses of life, uh, not being in church. I personally believe that the devil has been ruling for the last three months with the churches being closed. I, I personally think that the devil has had a heyday among the members. He has ravaged our members. Uh, there are very, very few 
that uh, will come back strong uh, and very, very few that maximized on these three months uh, to build their spirit man. So basically the message should be of healing and restoration. Uh, the, the message that uh, we are going to be preaching is the message of hope. Uh, it's the message that Christ is still the answer to all our problems. It's the message that, uh, you know, if God before you, who can be against you? Uh, it's the message of reminding the people, you know, just like Jonah was in the belly of the fish. We have been in the belly of the fish for quite some months now, in darkness and not seeing nothing happening. But if you can cry out from the belly of the fish, the Bible says that God had Jonah and delivered him from the belly of the fish. So basically that's the message that you're going to be preaching to the damaged goods that you're going to be receiving when the churches reopen again. It's not going to be the same. I know it's going to be difficult because even pastors themselves need to ask God for healing. They themselves are damaged. Wow. We will be receiving damaged goods. It can't yet get as open as that. Uh, but just come as you are. Uh, Bishop's message will be a lot of hope, restoration, and healing. And Christ is still the answer to all our issues and problems. So we look forward to seeing you. Let me just say yes, this. Sir. Um, I mean, again, thinking aloud. <laughs> Do you know the number of pastors who are depressed? Because the church has got closed. Do you know the number of pastors who, who left pastoring and went into selling sausages and stuff? I read that in the, in the newspaper, yes. what I'm just saying right yes. now. Yes. Uh, a pastor who stopped pastoring because of difficulties with finances and stuff, and went into selling sausages and stuff, uh, and many, many other things. Do you know the number of churches that will never come back because they were having rental facilities and uh, they didn't have their own facilities going? You know, uh, then the number of churches, by the way, let me tell you, and I want to say this from the outset, there's no church that will be the same. Wow. No There's no church, church that will be the same. same. Life has changed completely, totally. Has shifted. Completely. There are people who will always think that maybe I can do for a virtual church. I don't have to go to church. I've been doing virtual church. It's been working for me. Ch yes. Life will change completely. Totally. And we have to be, be pre prepared for the changes that will come mm -hmm. and take them as they are and change gears and, and adapt the new paradigms uh, for the state we're going to find ourselves in. Okay, I know I'm going off topic here, but pastors are damaged as well. Oh, what please. would you tell that pastor? Uh, during this time, I was feeding past some pastors. Yes. We were feeding some pastors. We were feeding some pastors because they didn't have something to eat. Uh, helping some pastors even uh, to be able to pay rent because they'll be thrown out of the house. Uh, and most pastors, you know, the problem is that even their wives are pastors. So both of them are being affected. You know, I don't know where they got the idea that if a pastor is a pastor, the wife should be a pastor automatically. Mm. <laughs> it's not in scripture. Yes. But it seems to be the fashion <laughs> that if a pastor is called, I don't believe in that myself, mm -hmm. that if a pastor is a pastor, the wife should be a pastor. I don't believe in that. Uh, but sometimes I do know that God can make your wife, you know, uh, a partner. And some actually end up being pastors because of the gracing of God. But uh, not all pastors' wives are supposed to be pastors, be pastors. Because she's not the one who was called. But if she's called along the way, it's fine, well and good. But most pastors find, force their wives to be pastors, and they're not pastors. So what do you do now? Your wife should be a lawyer, your wife should be a doctor, but you stopped her. And now the churches have been closed. And then you realize that you've got one source of income. And it's locked. It's gone. Wow, I think this is a topic for another day about how what do pastors, because even before they come to pastor other people, they need healing themselves. They need healing themselves. They need to, they need, they need, they need to know what, you see, about pastoring and preaching, if you're not careful, you'll end up preaching your bitterness. Mm. So be careful when you open the church that you don't preach your frustration and your bitterness. That's one thing that a lot of pastors don't realize, that you end up preaching what is in you. And not the message of Christ. And not the message of Christ. So a lot, I've, 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 I had a friend of mine who went through a very rough time, not in this country, in Nigeria. And uh, he was mistreated a lot by his, his, uh, his flock, uh, the members of the church. And he was so bitter. And every time he would talk, even one-to-one, uh, -one, you would see the bitterness just oozing from him. Every time he would preach, he would preach just about bitterness. So you've got to be careful. And pastors have to be careful because even pastors have been affected negatively and have been hurt 
uh, deeply with what has happened. So be careful if you're a pastor that you don't preach your frustration and your bitterness, but preach the message of Christ, which is hope uh, and uh, healing to the people that are coming because the church has never been a refrigerator where you restore, or where you store rather, uh, perfect and fresh things. A church is a hospital. Be the doctor and treat the patients. I think then, Bishop, this calls for spiritual leaders like you in this country to at some point organize a pastor's conference and just let pastors talk to each other. Well, we had one which had organized, but then in August, but then uh, because of what happened, uh, it yes. was rescheduled and stuff. Yeah. We'll see how we can uh, time allowing. But I don't see anything important happening this year. Yeah. Wow. Last week, Bishop, I had the honor of you as my father interviewing me. And uh, we talked about my book. I did bring a copy of my book here. I was interested to find out from you. Why, well, why did you write that book? And uh, I went through this book. Yes. and. Uh, I thought you said some things which uh, are crazy. Uh, really crazy, <laughs> man. <laughs> I really, I'll use a Kiswahili word, I you know? myself. Huh? I really. Once you're afraid, you know, that people will be scared of you, you know, people will be scared. Your girlfriend who you're going to marry will be scared. Yes. That you're too exposed. You talked about strip clubs. Strip clubs, yes. Uh, I didn't even know there were strip clubs in Kenya. I mean,. Uh, I thought that was just the U.S. level. No, in fact, the strip club I used to go to is opposite uh, where House of Grace used to be. Mm -hmm. So, my Damascus, I just switched from the strip club to the church. Interesting enough, you know, that club was there, but I never knew that at night it would change. I thought it was just a club. I was one of the greatest customers there. Wow. Yes. For how long? Oof. Two years. So, what, what made you go to the strip club? Let me just Emptiness. I was very empty. I felt like I have nothing to offer. So when you go to a strip club and you give them money, they will make you feel as if you are the best thing since sliced bread. So they give you all the attention. You let her realize it's not you they are giving attention. It's what you will give them that is making them. What are you talking about strip club? What are you talking about? Strip club, this is where women are dancing half naked in dimly lit places. And the more you give, the more they release. So if you give a 50 shillings, they'll just remove the bra like this and take it back. So you your 50 shillings, go and have fish somewhere else. So the, it's, it's, it's a way of enticing you to give more. Because the eyes are very, uh, they don't get satisfied if you're in a lustful place. So you want to give a thousand so that they remove the whole bra and then they come and dance next to you. And that was there. And then you, re you think it's only you they're dancing to. Not realizing as soon as you leave, another pot-bellied man will come there <laughs> with, <laughs> with more money than you, will even be given more attention. So it sucks you and sucks you and sucks you. So as you are doing the miracle service every Friday at House of Grace, I was at the strip club. Wow. I, it was called the barrel, three barrels or something, the barrel. Always there. And the interesting thing is that in those strip clubs, you'd get wives taking their husbands for their birthday as a present. So it's a whole life of immorality and lust that has captured many people. And those people are spending a lot of money. They're the people by day are dressed in good suits, good dresses, and driving good cars, and have good families. Uh, let me ask you this, yes. uh, from your experience, uh, now that you talk about strip clubs, uh, what are the dangers uh, of indulging in uh, strip clubs? Oh, debt, because it keeps calling you back, but it needs finances. One of the reasons I went into debt was strip clubs. Because you want to go there. And there is a time you say, I will never come back here. This is on a Wednesday night. Bishop, on Friday, you will go back. What happens, and I said in the book, mm -hmm. is that they dance, and as they're dancing, they're looking at you straight in the eye. That is where they're connecting with you. When you leave and you're at home sleeping, you are seeing that girl who was looking at you straight in the eye. And you'll go back the next day. Because you want that Let connection. me ask you, is it just a question of just looking at the women or uh, you would go to the next level of wanting their contacts? Yes. I do believe some have uh, maybe even met them out there. You know? Uh, because it's an immoral... My goodness, Bishop, if one was... was a How different is it from pornography? The difference is that pornography is on, a, on the net. Because... You are seeing women who are not giving you scriptures. So can you say you were addicted? I was addicted. For how long? Three years. So how did because you come out of that addiction? House of Grace. 
house of grace. I came to church. I was in a white trouser and a pink shirt. And you called me out. And you said, I don't know who you are. We have never met before. If I be a man of God, many think you're coming to God because of your problems. Your name will be known. And you said, I don't know in what level, but your name will be known if I be a man of God. That was the day I knew God remembered me. Wow. I wish Pastor Hes can look for those uh, videos. Because for me, it would be a part of my story. Because you know, you may say you people think you're just talking. I, I had a white trousers and a pink shirt. And you called me out. It says, I don't know who you are. We have never met. So how do you feel that now people use uh, your being honest, your being sincere to them and telling them, no, this is my story. Uh, these are my skeletons. A lot of people have got skeletons, but they hide them. Absolutely. You know, it's human nature to put your best foot forward. Yes. You know, now that you have not put your best foot forward and telling people, no, this is, was my story and this is how I got out. How do you feel when people judge you? I'm a human bishop. It, it hurts a little bit. But what gives me joy is that there are others who will inbox you and say, I'm struggling with what you used to struggle with. Help me get out. That is where the real ministry is. Now, if somebody judges me and I fall for it and I take all my focus there, then I'm doing disservice to the one who has come to me, not openly, in my inbox and say, I'm struggling with this. I have a case of somebody saying they're struggling with masturbation for seven years and pornography. Wow. And they're trying to get out. They don't know how. Now, those are the people I'm drawn to because strip clubs, Bishop, take you into debt, make you feel very filthy and and you but see you enjoy it when you're doing it you feel yes when do you, you as feel, you leave you feel filthy later yes because you keep on saying this is my last time in that's fact, bondage as, that's a bondage it is bondage as soon as you get out of the door you ask yourself what did i just do a man who has gone to university is well educated my father spent a lot of money and i'm seeing people who was who seem affluent and as soon as you leave, you feel disgusted and you go home, you're like, what did you even want to shower? Really? Two days later. Yeah, you just feel filthy in and out. The immediate aftermath. Oh. A day later, the same evening, something starts calling you. You remember the eye contact. You remember the lady coming and sitting on your laps and making you feel as if you feel the world has disowned you. But this woman is making you feel you are the best thing. Let me ask you. Yes. The men who are married who would come to strip clubs, how would that affect their marriage? It would, because now, you, these women are doing this as a career and as spirits. You may want your wife to do some of those things, but these women understand their trade. They're acting. Yes. They know they come and sit, and the moment you're getting comfortable with them, they get out. They go sit next to another, another man next to you, and they look at you like, aren't you jealous? Give me 5,000. This one has given me 2,000. So you, it's like competition. You get jealous. You, get, you want to be violent within your spirit. And some people who come there and their wives don't know will want their wives to be that. But I saw women bringing their husbands. I've never forgotten one. And I even sat next to them and they're like, yeah, it's my husband's birthday. I want him to enjoy. So the fact that you want to enjoy another woman sitting and 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 and, and uh, touching your husband and you're watching, that is also a, a very demonic thing in the marital bed. I think any it's, woman. It's doing very. That. It's very. It's from the West, but these things are not. They are. They're happening here. Well, any woman doing that is a disaster. Yes. To the marriage. Absolutely. That marriage will never be the same again. You know. You know. Some things we do. We don't look beyond the actions. Yes. Uh, that would be a disaster for any woman to take their husband there. That marriage will never be the same again yeah. because you have introduced your husband willingly uh, to a demonic spirit. Bishop, the bondage you know? is crazy. And she, the man will never be satisfied with the woman again, the wife, because the wife cannot up her game to that level. First of all, she's older, maybe. Yes. Uh, second of all, maybe she she's maybe plumpy. Uh, sorry. She can't do some of those things. She can't do some of those things. These are young girls who've got figures that your wife will never get again. Absolutely. Your wife has given birth. She can never have those figures again. Yes, yes. So, and if she introduces you to that, she's actually just send you to the dragons. She has handed you, because it's a bondage. And, and, and anybody 
who is struggling with the strip clubs. It appears fun. I can never recover those three years in that place. Remember, uh, you become empty. You are there the night, you are sleeping during the day. And when you're walking around, anybody who's looking at you, it registers in your mind, did they see me at the strip club? So even your confidence to go somewhere to present yourself goes down. So it's like you're throwing those years away. But that dragon keeps, in fact, they never release you. Even when you go home, it's like, as you left, they put a string on you. Mm -hmm. And they wake you up at seven in the evening. Hey, come back. And you'll go back. Now, strip clubs need money. Because the ladies come to dance to you and for you, not because you're wearing a good suit. No, not because you're handsome, not because you have a six pack. It's your wallet that counts. You will come there with your six pack. Somebody comes with a one pack, but his wallet is six pack. <laughs> they, will, they will go to that person. So you get into places of, instead of looking for money to do great things, you're throwing the money. That's not an investment. It's not shares you're buying. So it's like a bottomless pit and you're throwing it and you're throwing it. That is what happened to me until now. I just crossed over to House of Grace. So in this book, you tell us what? About how to I've spoken out. how I came out mm -hmm. uh, because some of these things you need a higher power. Yeah. You cannot come out by yourself. I've talked about that. I've talked about how I lost friends. I've talked about even how when I came to now into salvation, and I'll say this, Bishop, some of the most dangerous people are believers because believers want grace shown towards them, but they don't want anybody else to receive the same grace. I was listening to Jamal Brandt and he says, the church enjoys Paul but they don't show grace to Saul. Yet, without Saul, Paul would not have been. Correct. Yeah. So I, I also suffered that even up to now, the, the holier than thou. They're there. They're, all, they're on social media. They'll say, no, 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 no. You know. You know, I'm in the pulpit because I was pulled out of a pit. You know? But they're holier than thou. Let grace abound in everybody. Just the way well, you I think. It. I think uh, there's a lot of funny Christians myself. I've been a pastor for many, many years. I started pastoring at a very tender age. Yes. But I think, uh, as they normally say, that uh, the Christians are the only army that shoot their wounded soldiers. Absolutely. Sadly. And, and I think having uh, gone through this uh, COVID season, I do believe and I hope that even the church will come back in unity. You understand, you know, we are all struggling with something. Now, maybe when I was struggling with strip clubs, I would be judgmental about somebody who drinks. Exactly. Because I'm not struggling with drinking. Exactly. And somebody drinking will be judgmental. So let's just understand, we are all, all trying to fight this. Yes. And let's just stand with each other. There's something you said about the full armor of God. It doesn't have something for the back because we are covering each other's back. And the famous statement is back to back. So I hope that as we come back, it's back to back. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Bishop. And yes. uh, we How can people get this book? Uh, just uh, inbox us on uh, Robert Bura Israel Robert Burale on, uh, on Facebook or Burale1 on my Instagram and my team will get back to you. We shall deliver the book to where you are. If you're out of town, we shall send it to you, but then you cover the charges. Okay. So Bishop, thank you very much. Thank you all for watching Coffee with BDM. Tomorrow you can still start a watch party. I know some of your friends, maybe in America because of the time zones are still asleep. Start a watch party and let people enjoy because this is a message that must reverberate in every corner of this world and it will help each and every one of us. Until next week, thank you very much. Make sure you have a date with us. Coffee with BDM, um, 8 p.m. every Friday, East African time. Now this Sunday, Bishop David Moredi has another powerful, powerful message. Um, make sure you join us. Thank you very much and God bless.